so I'm just going to uh, introduce the speakers to you this evening. Um, so of course you have already been introduced today to uh, Cassandra O'Connell, who's head of the Irish Film Archive, uh, and also uh, Fran, Fran Rowlett McCormick, um, who is an archive producer working for RMC um, Media Partnership, and this is some of their equipment here, uh, behind the panel now. Um, we also have Alessandra Lucciano, um, who is based uh, since 2013 uh, at the CNA's uh, Moving Image Archive. And we also have uh, Lawrence Napper with us this evening, who is a senior lecturer in film studies at King's College London, and he uh, is the author of the blog that started this whole YAMS <laughs> debate off. So please go and, and, and look at it. Um, if you have the opportunity. So what I'm going to do now is just show you uh, the trailer of For They Shall Not Grow Old, uh, just to give you, if you haven't seen it, an indication of what we're going to be talking about. I was 16 years old and my father allowed me to go. I was just turned 17 at the time. I was 16. I was 15 years. When they came to us, they were frightened children and had to be made into soldiers. Yeah, boys, here it comes. We're in the pictures. <laughs> I gave every part of my youth to do a job. job to be done and you just go on and did it. Peter Jackson of course I have seen a clip of him claiming uh, that he invented film restoration so um, would you like to do this? Yes, do you want to go to my first yeah. slide? <coughs> Um, I thought it would be useful to start with this because it is the baseline for film archivists um, and I think it explains, I don't need to read it out, but it, it gives you um, an understanding of the code of ethics that International um, Federation of Film Archive members sign up to and what our um, use of manipulation of um, making material accessible um, and so on is based on. Um, this came to my mind when I listened to um, or watched the video of the previous um, discussion that um, Iwala mentioned there. Um, and there were some members of the audience that were wondering why archivists and archives felt that they should be gatekeepers of how material was used. Um, and this is the reason, um, because it's what we sign up to. Um, we're not against people using material in an inventive ways, but there has to be a level of integrity and a level of um, honesty about what they're doing. And I think that is probably where I have the greatest issue with what Peter Jackson has done. Um, to say 
on any level that what he's done is a restoration is complete nonsense and makes a nonsense of the terminology that we use as archivists. He hasn't restored anything to... Restoration is a process of going back to the original. That is not anything original. That is a new work. It's a, a, a reimagining of archival sources that has created a new artistic um, entity uh, and, and that's fine, as long as that's what he represents it as. Um, it completely writes out the work of the Imperial War Museum for 100 years and making sure that this material still exists. It writes out all of the preservation um, and restoration work that they've done. Um, I was at the Imperial War Museum um, when they were doing one of their scans of um, the Battle of the Somme, um, and I know how good that work was. Um, we actually have the scanner now that they used for that, they donated it to us. So I know the level of detail, the level of work that was done. And um, as Lawrence has mentioned before, um, you know, this material exists because <coughs> of the work of preservationists. Um, it has been put out to the public many times um, and looked at in many different ways. And I think it's a, it's a really interesting example of the war or the tension between um, archivists and the organizations that they work within. Because often we work within larger institutions that have different agendas and different needs. And they're not signed up to the FIAF Code of Ethics. They want to get bang for their book. They want to um, make an impression. They want something that's very transformative. So they'll use terms like restoration um, when they mean digitization, or they'll use terms like digitization when they mean telecine, and they don't really know what any of this language means, which to archivists who have very specific meanings for these things um, can be quite problematic, but I think for a non-specialist audience, we've, we've lost the war um, when it comes to this kind of terminology. But we would have a similar um, you know, situation often where our PR team, um, or the you know other members of um, the institution want to make what we've done sound even more dramatic than it actually is and it's perfectly dramatic um, just doing the process of preservation we don't need to try and make it more um, impressive or exciting um, another thing that really struck me about um, all of this and could we go to the last slide I think it's the last slide yeah, yeah this one um, I've been looking at the colorization um, controversy of the 1980s and how that had led really to the birth of official um, film preservation in America, the, the current um, uh, era of it, um, led by Martin Scorsese and others. And that was a reaction to the colorization of film by people like Ted Turner. Um, and the horror um, that was felt amongst the filmmaking community at this being done. And it just seems hugely ironic now that you have filmmakers leading this. Um, and um, the, the legislation that was put in place in the late in the 1980s in the States, um, the film registry, uh, was to try and prevent this kind of thing. Um, and now we've come full circle where people like Peter Jackson are um, <coughs> taking archival uh, material and doing all of these things that were considered absolutely horrendous. And you can read this Woody Allen quote for yourself. Um, and I think he articulates exactly the problems that many of us would have um, with what Peter Jackson has done. Um, the other thing that I found quite interesting um, was that it was the film historians and um, media studies people that were initially critical of this rather than archivists. Um, and even within FIAF, there were quite a few people in FIAF who you know, thought this was perfectly fine or this was a very good um, project. And it was only really when we drilled down a little bit further and started to have conversations about, well, actually, it's not a restoration. And while it's great, if what you're looking at is ways to engage you know, new audiences, that's completely fine. Um, but it does misrepresent what archivists do um, and as I said, the, the problem that I have is that it, it writes so many people out of the history of, 
of this work. The people who shot it in the first place, um, you know, the people who have um, looked after it for all of this time to get it to the, the, the point that it's at. And then there's the issue as well of this idea that people won't engage with black and white footage, which we all know is complete nonsense. <laughs> and the ex exact same conversations happened in the 80s. It's like, oh, we need to, you know, get the Maltese fal falcon and make it um, colour or nobody's going to watch it. Mm -hmm. People still watch, you know, canonical film. Um, there is no problem with people watching, um, you know, the great Hollywood films and the idea that they wouldn't be able to engage with... Um, actuality because it's black and white is is nonsense um, and I think the point has been made as well that uh, and I think I showed it in my clip earlier on with the before and after a lot of time the the ideas that people have about archival footage um, and the quality of it is completely based on the, f the original film being let down by the technology that transferred it at the time that it was transferred and then people just reusing those bad transfers over and over again um, as we know, you know, Peter Jackson went out of his way to try and make this material look way worse than it actually was. Um, you know, it would have been a hand cranked um, camera at the time, so it would have had a variable speed. And all that was required really was for somebody to sit down and to do a digitization and make sure that it was at the right speed. Um, and while I've no issue with him going back and taking out um, damage that would have occurred over time to try and get it back to its original um, in what it would have looked like originally uh, anything else um, you know is not restoration and I worked in conservation in the National Museum for many years and one of the things about conservation and restoration is that you document everything that you do and it should be undoable so if you make an intervention you should be able to know exactly what you did and then undo it and I don't think that uh, that was something that Mr Jackson was thinking of. <laughs> anyway rant over on to the next person <laughs> <laughs> okay so I I'm very conflicted by this in the sense that um, very recently I finished working on another film about Billie Holiday, which has been colourised. So, um, I'm sitting here as like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so um, uh, my feel on it is, uh, whilst I think I agree with pretty much everything you've just said, uh, so I'd like to make that clear in terms of um, the the wording of you know the restoration side of things. Um, the there are lots of other things about the film that I really, really don't like as a person viewing it critically. Um, I think the things that I object to more than the colorization are actually elements of the film themselves, which had it not been colorized, I would have still objected to. So there's a, an element there that all of these things are sort of coming together in the one film, if that makes sense. And actually, is it the colorization or is it some of the other things combined that makes it even more annoying to people than if it was just the colorization. So I'm very conflicted about that and I don't think I've made up my mind. Sorry if that sounds really crap. But what, what are I, the other elements that annoyed you more? You I suppose all the normal things that people quote, which is you know the lack of um, honesty in terms of reflecting the different cultures that maybe uh, were in, uh, in the trenches. Um, the fact that it kind of gives a warm glow in many ways to the whole, in my opinion, it gives a, a bit of a warm, colourised glow to the whole, of, the whole film, it makes it feel cinematic, you know, in a not good way. Um, yeah, I could, I, yeah, could go on and on and on. All the things that probably we're all going to say. However, and this is my and yet comment on it. If you talk to my fourteen-year-old boy who's doing his you know GCSE history um, he enjoyed it he he talked to me about the history behind it afterwards um, he would also enjoy watching black and white films and he would also enjoy watching a number of other historical documentaries it's not about that so much it made us talk and I think if anything has come out of all of this it's that we're talking about it you know so one thing that um, 
Peter Jackson has done, um, the makers of this film have done, is actually shoot this right up in terms of it's a, it's a common debate now. Um, and to me, that's a good thing. You know, that we are sitting here talking about it is a good thing. Um, because maybe, you know, n the next set of whatever happens with archive footage, whether that be Billie Holiday dancing in colour or whether that be, you know, something else which I can't even imagine will happen to archive film, um, maybe the context of this is, oh, we don't necessarily want to do it like that. You know, maybe somebody will use this as an example of how, I'm not wanting to be too critical, but of how not to do it. And surely that's, that's not a totally bad thing. Um, and also, you know, I'm still ambivalent about the colorization aspect of it. I know it's not restoration, mm -hmm. and I know it's a new piece of work. Um, if we do anything with our archive that makes it closer to people who are younger and further away from it, uh, I, I, I don't think that's always a bad thing. Um, you know, in, in my opinion, I think it's, it's possibly a good thing in some respects. <coughs> But it always has to be done with the understanding that this is what we are doing. Um, if, if that makes sense, it has to be. It has to be clear, as you say, yeah. documented. And again, people who are making these films need to be clear about the terminology that they're using. I know from my job, I'm finished now, but I know from my job that w when you're making these films, you want any sort of handle that you can use that will help you advertise the film. So the one thing that I've heard so many times is this has never been seen before. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you've all heard it. Um, and when you ask people to quantify what that means, they actually mean they've looked at the record of it being issued from the archive and they've found that it, there's no records. That doesn't mean, see, mean it's never been seen before. Itself. The cataloger has seen it. Um, but there's somebody hasn't filled out the little tick on the box that said we loaned this to somebody. It, it, those phrases are, are virtually meaningless, in my opinion, unless you genuinely have found the film in a shoebox in Guatemala, you know, um, and it's still in its original packaging. I don't think, realistically, many archives could really stand over. This has never been seen before, or it's fresh out of the can, or whatever other analogy you want to use for it. Um, this has never been seen in this way, before um, as, as an adaption of uh, original pieces but there is a dishonesty about how this was made that I, I can't get my head around quite whilst still being happy about the fact that my 14 year old talked to me about World War One history because of it so that's my opinion yeah so I was um, when I was asked to be on this panel I um, I was, okay, I was trying to think what irked me so much about the film, and I kind of um, agree with what you're saying that the colorization is kind of the least of my problems. Although I saw it on my on my phone the second time, and I zoomed in, like to see how bad it actually was. <laughs> <laughs> just like the, the the faces were blurred. Yeah. Um, it was just it was just terrible. And uh, but the first thing that really struck me. Um, was the fact that he kind of... Okay, so first of all, when you even look at the trailer, it's like, Peter Jackson presents the Great War. What? <laughs> yeah. 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 He was so there. He was there. <laughs> um, so that already... So, so, and I don't know if that's a symptom of how we treat arts and culture in our society, but an historical fact doesn't have to be an experience. Like, you don't have to have a Disney ride of the Great War. Um, you do, know, you do know that's going to happen now, don't you? Probably. I mean, exactly. trademark me. Give me some money for this idea now. Um, so, so, and, and, and you saw it again, even in the film. It's like very jolly. It's like yeah. the one guy talks about how he's been in the Boy Scouts, so war was fun and easy for him. Like, I was in the Boy Scouts, and I, I would have <coughs> shit my pants down in the trench. <laughs> um, and so what I did is I compare, I, I, for shits and giggles, because nothing else to do, you, I started watching Ken Burns' Vietnam. And just the like sheer differences between how he treats like you know it's it's war, yeah. it's not fun, it's not an experience anybody of us wants to have, and yet the way that they shall not grow old has um, is presenting it is like this fun like some some guys because they're all anonymous as well. I was even very surprised to see all the names. I was like, there's fifty people talking about in this. It just feels like the same guy. Hundred and nine. 109. It just feels like, um, no offense to anybody, like Jerry from the ship, chip shop. You know, it's the same guy. And they're all white. 
And you have like a small glimpse of like what are probably colonial fighters, like black and brown people. And so this is what, what you were talking in 1418, like all the things that 1418 is talking about and is mentioning is what was missing. Context, different point of views. The fact that they sent their, um, the, the, the people from the colonies first to die first, like all these things were just like, it's just one, it's a, it's a, it's, hmm, how can I say it? It's like, you know how Transformers is just a guy who was lucky enough to like blow shit up on a big budget? Because that's what he did as a child with his like Legos? It's the equivalent to that. And that's what kind of irks me because it's such a humane, like world shattering experience. And the fact that even in 1418, he, they then do talk about World War II. And that's what Vietnam does too. Like it goes yeah. way back and it goes way forward. It's just at this point, I don't think we should talk about they shall not grow. We should just forget it. So maybe it will like leave um, this earth somehow. For <laughs> stop. <laughs> no, but it's true. And the other thing that really that really was upsetting is that he copyrighted it. Are you serious? Uh, at the end of it, he's like, this image is copyrighted, all infraction, all like blah blah blah. You'll get sued. It's like, oh, come on. Like the, the minimum, the modicum of respect is to say like, I've made this film on, I'm assuming, well, I don't know if this public domain footage, but it's like world heritage at this point. And then you go in and you claim copyright because you colorized it. I think that is so insulting to the memory of the world, like generally speaking. Um, and, and the memory so, of the people who actually and the, shot the footage. Exactly. And the memory of people who have actually shot the footage and, and all the conservators. And that's yeah. why I agree with what yeah. you're saying. Like not only did he just amass and turn it into one dude talking about his Boy Scout experience. <laughs> and that one scene when they're on the benches and the benches collapses because they're on the toilet. Ha ha, Hilarious, funny. Yeah. Funny, Look, great, like pictures. poo humor. <laughs> Yay, poo humor. Yeah. Um, anyway, sorry. I'm like, yeah, I'm yeah, like, but it's a, so I agree. And it faces all these, all the people, all the work that goes in into preserving archive right. and maintaining it. And the advocacy we have to do because it's so easy to get rid of museums, to get rid of culture, to get to get rid of arts, because it's not important, right? It's not life threatening. Like yeah. we're not saving lives, but we. But what people forget is that we make life worth living. Yeah. Like you can be super healthy, but if there's no museum, no cinema, no music, then no offense, you might as well just like, yep. eh, go to the trenches. I don't know. <laughs> it's just um, so these were just a. Um, it, it felt insulting on multiple levels. Um, so kind of the coloring came kind of like after a while as the last <laughs> of the issues because it's just plain and simple. The bad movie, and that's what you were saying. Yeah. Like I would have. It's a bad movie. It could have been black and white. And it it could have been black. Like, it was. It, it's still. It, quite, that would be my basic. Mm, yeah. Thing with it. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like you don't, again, just to come back to this idea of like it has to be an experience for people to react to. I don't think that's true. And it's kind of the meaning uh, to what we do as archivists, as historians, as people that live and breathe arts and culture, which is not just a separate, it's, it's life. Um, it's like a cheap thrill. And I don't, it's not worth it in so many ways. And it's a shame because we don't need to have an experience to discuss and, and, and be critical of history and, and 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 react to it and have a, a genuine interaction with um, our history our histories the plural you know I've got four things I was okay. going to say before we stop talking <laughs> no, no, film, no, no, and no. put a full stop on it we've all let Lauren yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got four things I want to say two which come out of the things that the others have said and two of things that kind of I've said before but I'm going to come back to them because I, I think they're sort of part of the deal first thing is um, not just the filmmakers are not credited, but those interviews, the, the interviewers mm -hmm. uh, for those interviews are not credited, uh, one of whom is my brother-in-law. <laughs> um, and he was pretty angry <laughs> about that. Um, uh, not invited even to the Yeah, he just mentions premiere. one sentence. Thank you for those who did this interview. Yeah, that and actually the publicity suggests that those interviews were done for primarily for the Great War yeah. for the BBC in the 60s. And in fact... My brother-in-law has been doing those interviews for the Imperial War Museum for years and years, for his entire career. He's retiring this year, and you know that was he was he was excised from the project. Um, <laughs> one of the reasons, perhaps, has been suggested to me, and it's worth thinking about in terms of the kind of ethics of colorization, is it may be that one reason why um, all of the f featured. Uh, people in the film are white is because if they were not white you would be effectively digitally black facing, black -facing. Them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's I mean that's something to think about 
in terms of the ethics of the film, not just in terms of blackface ethics, but also in terms of whiteface ethics. I think there's a sort of issue to be uh, uh, questioned. Shouldn't that have been the first red flag? <laughs> <laughs> if I digitised it on digitally blackfacing, maybe I shouldn't do it? I don't know. Yeah, it's like, how do you know what colour these people are? It's like, anyway. Um, uh, other thing I'm sort of concerned with, and I, I, I'm, I'm sort of a bit in the same... I mean, I think some of the colorization is really beautiful. I think it's really, you know, amazing. Like, basically the stuff in the trailer. Um, because where the problem comes, I think, when he both colorizes and zooms in. Yeah. And, and it's that sense of uh, that somehow, effectively, what he wants to make is a film which uses today's yeah. cinematic yeah. aesthetics of realism. So the, the, you know, the, the handheld camera, the zooming in, the explosion that suddenly, you know, the kind of, he's trying to follow the explosions to make sure that he, we know that he's, so he takes an image where there are explosions happening like a long way away, like in the whole image, and he zooms in to the explosions here, and then the camera moves across. So he's trying to make out that somehow this film was made by a modern cameraman using modern aesthetics of cinematic realism. And I sort of think, like, what is, what is interesting about this film? Surely the thing that's interesting about this film is that it was made then and those people are the actual people and, you know, it, it has an indexical relationship with reality in that that cameraman was there in front of those people who were there in that environment. If you... If, in order to make that film... You know, yes. attractive to young people, yeah. you have to change it so much that it's completely unrecognisable mm -hmm. and that those men would, like, I mean, they wouldn't, like, literally, I don't think they would be able to read the film because they would have no, you yeah. know, historical figures don't, you know, they don't, they don't see cinematic realism as wobbly camera work and, you know, what Jackson did with The Hobbit. They, they, their version of cinema is completely different anyway. So that's a... Um, so, but if you are, if what you're doing to the film to make young people engage in it is destroying everything that is actually authentic about it, then what's the point of the exercise? Like, it's not the thing that make you're... Make a feature, like make a mm -hmm. fiction yeah. film yeah, instead. Yes, yeah, you might yeah. as well make yeah. a reconstruction. Yeah. There are some really great war reconstruction films. Sam Mendes. The Sam Mendes sort of like, you might as well just do that. Mm -hmm. Then you can do what you like, then you can... Yeah. Anyway. So, that's one thing. And then the final point I've got to make is about the in the kind of um, institutional kind of process. Well, I think this is a really extreme example of something that archives quite often do. It comes back to the thing that you were saying, it's like, if we're going to just erase cultural institutions, like there's plenty of people who want to erase cultural institutions. Cultural institutions don't need to do it for themselves. And I think there's a sense <laughs> in which the Imperial War Museum have done that. They got into bed with Jackson. <laughs> And as a result, they were erased from the situation. I'm sure when those meetings were happening at the beginning, it was all about, this is going to showcase our archive, it's going to showcase our work, it's going to give us great uh, public, uh, you know, kind of profile and so forth. And, I mean, it has. I, I'm sure the managers of the Imperial War Museum think it's marvellous because it has given them great public profile and everything. But, of course, for the archivists, like, the film literally says they don't know what they're doing. Yeah. <laughs> It's like, and obviously I was with the archivists when this was all happening, and they were, they were pretty upset about it, and they had been very firmly gagged. I mean, you had, to, you had to really work hard to get them to say anything about it. And when, I, when, I, when the blog came out, it's like they, they, they were coming up to me secretly at it's like launch events and saying, oh, thank you for writing that, you know, it was so awful doing that because we couldn't, we couldn't object. We were just, you know, we were closed down. So there's a sense in which... It's like, uh, I think institutionally, it's a lesson to, mm, yeah. uh, you know, cultural institutions that actually, yes, <laughs> you have to be careful about losing control. And there, even now, that. I mean, they're very reticent to talk about it. You yeah. know, they will off the record, mm. but even, you know, at FIAF yeah, meetings, yeah. Mm. you know, it's, mm. there isn't a discussion and there's not, you know, they will talk about the processes and the fact that they lost creative control, but then they'll talk about why it's a good, you know, the end result was a good thing as well as, you know, having, leave it to us to decide whether or not we think it ethically it's w What went down in FIAF? Can you reveal what the discussion um, was? I mean, well, it, it wasn't terribly <laughs> um, 
I mean, it's online. It's on this. Oh. I was going to say, yeah, yeah it was you, for the public can, record because it yeah. wasn't. A, it's it was it's during the Congress. So yeah. Oh, okay. So, so it, it, it's it online. Formed, so so anything else that might have been said, I don't know. But <laughs> you know, I, I would know David Walsh quite well, um, and so I was aware of all of this process. And I think there was a kind of resignation to a, a certain degree that institutionally, as I said, um, and as you also said this is a very extreme example but it's something that archivists grapple with every day because we have one vision of what we're trying to do and then we have our broader institutions that want to achieve certain things and we have to try and walk that line between both because if we don't achieve what our broad, bigger institution wants we don't get the resources um, and they have you know their they have their agenda and um, that's just as valid from their point of view as what we're trying to do and we all have to work together anyway so i think that there was a certain amount of that in the imperial war museum where you know they kind of felt like okay we started a process that then we lost control of and you know ultimately we don't make the decisions um so i'd be interested to see what happens in the long run if you know it does result in you know more resources for them because sometimes you can justify these things if you know that there will be a payoff in the long term mm -hmm. um but that's hard hard to know um it doesn't always ha this is the thing because accidentally um i've just been forwarded an email about an outside person requesting uh footage black and white footage from the cna because he is developing an automated like an art artificial intelligence coloring yeah. thing and we said no. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the thing is, is like our collections don't always need to serve an added value. Like it's great if you can if you can put your collections, your sound, especially sound, if you want to develop like artificial intelligence in terms of like recognition, maybe, you know, like captioning, like stuff that actually helps people useful, yeah. useful access your collections because they are they have a certain type of Im impediment physical or other. So that's fantastic if big, big data, I'm calling it big data because it's not like we have, you know, can feed into that. But feeding into somebody's desire to artificially color everything that's black and white, our collections have a right to exist without them having to add to something else. And I, that gave us so, so coincidental that we just got in this email. Yeah, I think, um, the, sorry, I was going to say as well, I think the artificial intelligence side of that is actually really interesting because my perception in a small way is that that's possibly where things are maybe heading um so we may go from and this, i'm just kind of making this up in my in my own mind from having dealt with clients that we're actually going into a situation where colorization is kind of a bit old hat yeah. um and possibly now we are looking at ai interventions into um, you know, archive footage and using archive footage in a different way, maybe reinventing it in a different way. Um, and I'm, I'm quite interested in, you know, whether this action in this particular instance <coughs> possibly might block that. Um, and I'm, again, still conflicted as to whether that's altogether a bad thing or whether it's a good thing that we just block. You know, because one thing went badly doesn't necessarily mean to say that everything else after that will be. Um, and I think the sad thing about this is that certainly when I deal with the companies and the archives, there is a terror of colorization that has um, ha happened as a result of this. So there are contracts now with you're not allowed to colorize it. You know, and there I would deal with that all the time. Been there. Yeah, but I'm, all I'm saying is that that's across the that maybe should have, as you say, happened across the board. But it's quite a recent phenomena in terms of me looking at the contract at the end of the day and saying, oh, no colorization. Right, OK, tick that box. So um, that's an, it's just a result of, of bad vibes, isn't it, with, with this? Well, I guess, I mean, one of the things, the conversations I had with the, with the, um, the folk at the Imperial Museum was our contract says there's no colorization. And now that this has happened, we kind of can't say that to, to TV companies because they're going to say, well, duh, duh. Yeah. just a minute. It's like it, it sets a precedent, which actually no wonder they're terrified because they've set a precedent. I, I think they, they probably can. can. I think they could probably they will, say yeah. it kind of went, yeah, yeah, it went can. a bit wrong. <laughs> yeah, and, and you can always say, you know, you have exceptional circumstances because, I mean, there's there's been colorized footage yeah, of yeah. the war many times yeah. before, um, and it doesn't mean that everybody gets to do it. But, you know, again... Uh, and the reason I put up the slide about the CF Code of Ethics, you know, we can always go back to that. 
Um, and that's why as members of FIAF, we sign up to this code of ethics so that we are able to say when we have external forces or internal forces, you may not be aware of this, but to be a member of this organization, mm -hmm. we have signed up to this. Um, so therefore you may think that, mm -hmm. you know, it's wonderful that young people will engage with, you know, um, 3D zoomed mm -hmm. colorized footage, but as archivists, we have to make sure that if you do that, that you present it in a very specific way. Um, and Peter Jackson didn't do that. He is pretending that it's a more authentic experience, mm -hmm. a more authentic um, example than the original footage, which of course it isn't. It's, it's completely manipulated. Yeah, and I do understand that a lot of, uh, like my institution, like any other archive, a cultural heritage institution needs to think what, what, what is the collection gonna look like in 10 to 20 years? Who are our audiences? What are they gonna, you know, be looking, you know, like, what are the platforms they're going to consume it on or engage with it? Um, so that's definitely something that I think about, but it's not either or at all. So it's, as you say, it's it's it's, it's creating. Um, in you know, you have to be informed. You have to know what you know the, the power structure between what is happening to your footage. So you hopefully this will help people create a certain language around all of this. Um, because something I've been thinking about is there's a big gaming industry in Luxembourg, and sometimes they do these like historical. Um, games and then they, they virtually recreate Luxembourg and sometimes I'm thinking well couldn't it be awesome if they would take our footage and like turn it into 3D yeah. and have it into like a rad medieval game of yeah. you know yeah. Luxembourg and I'm like yeah. well that that sounds yeah. like fun yeah. and uh, you know then young people not so young people whoever is a gamer can engage with with authentic footage that's been manipulated not manipulated but that's you know has a, a diff another version yeah. Yeah. Reuse, or another yeah. a reuse yeah. a, yeah. a different live on a different platform um, but that doesn't mean that my nitrate original <laughs> cannot exist as a nitrate original and be projected as such on a and during a yeah. film festival in a way. So that I think it's it is something that we all think about, but it's how you go about in doing it. I, I think you're right. This is totally counterproductive to who you are as an institution and what you stand for. And you don't want to undermine, you know, the historic validity Absolutely. of the original <laughs> source material and wipe that out. Um, because that's the other thing, you know, this is a historical record, mm -hmm. um, even though it's been created in a certain way with a certain bias or whatever. Um, but, you know, that's really important and as archivists. We're not just there as content providers, you know, exactly. we're there to preserve mm -hmm. collections. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because of course, like what, what I'm thinking of, like, oh, okay, so say in 10 years, we have like this cool game where you know are so hopefully people will come back to the archive and then get intrigued yeah. Yeah. you know because that's what that's what we want like yeah. we are mm -hmm. on different platforms not because that's the end goal the yeah. end goal <laughs> is for them to come back to yeah. us <laughs> that and is and not the final destination interrogate the, the primary, the primary source. source i mean I think yeah. that, exactly. that's what really interested me about all of those that's kind of partly why i was asking that question about the music earlier is that sense of um there are certain things that archives do where you get to see the whole film and you get into the film and you research the film. And obviously it's not everybody, not everybody's gonna do that. But what you're looking for is you're looking to like reach lots of people so at least some people will engage in that. And I wonder if some of those projects, and I'm thinking of the kinds of Sea to the Land Beyond kind of yeah. like uh, essay films that are effectively images to music of yeah. famous musicians, yeah. whether they actually create that effect, whether people see that bit of clip in that British Sea Power film and like go for it, or if they're just like, oh yeah, I just enjoyed that British Sea Power film and it was bye bye. I so. think if, if there isn't a policy of developing those audiences, I think if you just do this as something to showcase your archive, um, maybe it is you just get a new audience in, they, they see, um, the venue, they're experiencing something different and they may or may not ever darken your door again. Um, but if you have um, a policy of trying to develop those audiences and it's not a one-off like we do where we've been doing this, you know, systematically for years with different types of musicians in different venues, in different parts of the world, um, and then building on it um, because we'll put together a program or we'll commission a score or whatever, but then we'll put it on the iFi player or we'll release it on DVD or it'll be on television. Um, and then we'll follow it up with something else and it'll be an ongoing partnership. So you're building an audience. Um, and then we know 
um, from people coming in and saying, oh, I was at such and such a thing and I'd like to research this or I want to use a bit in my um, production or, you know, we see the same people coming back over and over again. So there has to be thought behind it. Doing a one-off and just because you've got a big name, you know, I could go out and do a, a video with gorillas tomorrow or whatever and think, oh, all the gorillas fans are suddenly going to know about the Irish Film Archive and love us. <laughs> and of course they're not going to. Um, but if you were, you know, doing a number of activities that were targeting different audiences and there's thought behind it and how you develop that audience, then I think it does pay off. I think one of the things about this whole debate that's really interesting is that the link up between documentary filmmaking and education is really important. So it doesn't have, it, you know, this isn't <coughs> my view of something educational. It's a view, it's a, a way to initiate discussion, but to try and get, if we're talking about engaging younger audiences, to try and get them to take a more critical eye, look at things with a more critical eye. I don't think it's necessarily about not letting them watch this. I think it's about giving them alternatives to this that are more interesting because they're more real or whatever that means. You know, this is one view from pretty much one person mm -hmm. who basically took everything and mixed it all together and made a big splash. Um, it, it, you know, there are lots of other documentaries that maybe haven't had as big as an exposure, which if you put them up against this, it would be even much easier to see the comparison. Um, so it's about trying to get people to see. I like the theme nice. I like the thought of, you know, bringing the theme into the educational experience for, for the, not necessarily just younger people, but you know, people in general. Um, and I wouldn't be anti, and everybody's going to curl up and die, but I wouldn't be anti um, showing bits of this alongside different documentaries to sort of show the different perspectives of, of what actually you know, different filmmakers can make of the sa same footage. This is an extreme example. There were other, you know, we saw earlier examples, um, and I agree with you, your examples were better. Uh, <laughs> much better. <laughs> but that... By showing those two films together, you know, that's a really good way of showing people the difference. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you. We do a lot of um, work around media literacy um, with school children um, um, with, through our education department. Um, and I think, you know, this would be a perfect example of something that you could show them and talk to them about manipulation mm -hmm. of images and of history and narratives that are being put forward and then ask them to look at something else and do a comparison. So um, I'm going to suggest that yeah. when yeah. I go back. Because, yeah. <laughs> you know, that makes it, I'm, I'm going to argue that that makes this, by using it in that way, it makes this slightly less horrific. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Because you you make of it something better than, than yeah. it is in, in, an, in terms of an educational experience. But also there's a sense in which educating educating students is educating students but w one thing that you can do like I mean one of the things that really surprised me about this is that nobody's nobody seemed to have seen the film that I had seen you like mm -hmm. ordinary people in the street yeah. were saying how yeah, marvelous it was yeah. and how beautiful it was and how realistic it was yeah. and I was like in the first shot when you get those marching soldiers their legs disappear that's kind of fundamental <laughs> in terms of like a good restoration their legs shouldn't disappear they disappear <laughs> has, can nobody see this and nobody in those audiences saw that. Yeah. And so that kind of, I mean, but you the kind of event you're talking about where you, you can say, it. here's what's that, yeah. and here's that, and look yeah. look, look, look at their legs this week. <laughs> Why is that happening? Mm, well, let's talk about, you know, that yeah. sort of. And I was delighted when I read your blog. <laughs> I was delighted. Because <laughs> I was like, am I the only person? And to find somebody else who actually thought, we, oh, wow. When we restore, when we restore, I'm going to use quotes now. Um, when we um, use the Phoenix machine on um, archive footage, there is always a question in your mind, I mean, Robert talked about this, about, you know, how much restoration and what is it? And what is it you're doing to the film? You know, if you're removing a few scratches, that may be okay. Um, if you're slowing it down, you know, well, okay. Um, how much further do you want to take that? And, and this, as you say, is an extreme example. It's not restoration, it's alteration. And that's, yeah. that's, a, that's where it kind of... Um, that's where it kind of sits, but yeah, 
uh, it would have been kind of very nice if the BBC and the IWM had, had used that as an opportunity to introduce a whole season yeah. mm. of, of yeah. related mm. relevant yeah. films. Yeah. 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 Not just for educational purposes, well, but for general public yeah. Yeah. purposes. It was really a missed it's opportunity. Because yeah. they put everything into just the big into that. splash yeah. And, yeah. And, and lost yeah. a lot along the way. Yeah. Mm. And they, I mean, they obviously, they forgot that they had, in fact, sent the Battle of the Somme in its restored state. Yeah, two schools. Out to yeah, cinemas, yeah. you know, like yeah, two years yeah. previously yeah. in mm-hmm. 2016. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And the, there's a constant search for the new way of doing things. So, and that's absolutely fine. You know, you want, you want that. Um, I much preferred, um, there's a documentary about seeing the war from the air. Mm. Because... It was a completely fresh way of looking at the war. Um, I don't know how accurate or otherwise it was. As a viewer, I enjoyed watching it, but it also showed the war from a totally different perspective, quite literally. And to me, that was a lot more special, for want of a better word. It was a lot more meaningful than this. But you could do lots of things with showing them up against each other. Yeah. You know. I think that's a good time, actually, to, to throw it open to the, the floor now to, to take some points. Question. Yeah. Do you want to go first? Uh, sure. Um, I, I think one of the weirdest things about the film was that it was also in 3D. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I forgot. I didn't see it in 3D, but I know that it was shown in 3D, yeah. and you know, some of it was, was turned into 3D. Did Which anyone see it in 3D at no. all? No. We no. showed it in 3D, in like we showed this, not me personally, but our <laughs> institution <laughs> um, showed this when when it was out, and I mean, it was really popular. That's, that's um, what you, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. There's something so bizarre. I mean, I think in some ways it's true of the colorization as well, or maybe even just the making of the film in general. But, like, I mean, 3D is about immersion and wanting to feel like you're there and stuff like that. Like, <laughs> Why would anyone want there? to? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one. Like, what is that desire to be there that, we're, that this film is addressing? I, mean, I find that very strange. But also, that's not unusual in First World War films. I mean, like, the, the, the Imperial War Museum had a trench experience exhibit yeah, for years yeah, and years. Yeah. That sort of sense is so like endemic. Right. It's, it's almost like this desire for immediacy just eclipses that reality that you know the film is purporting to show. Like, of course, we don't want to experience the reality of what. No, we, we don't want to. We should like, think we want to, you know, but we do. Maybe we should have an experience, it's a trench experience, where well, like there's your Disney theme park. This is it. Yeah. At some point, yeah. you know, okay, three so get again. killed. <laughs> Again, 14, 1418, you're talking about the new technology that has developed, right? So mustard gas. There's a, literally a scene where they're walking through mustard gas and they're like, <laughs> happy campers. <laughs> and I'm just like, <laughs> no. <laughs> so maybe they should do uh, mustard gas yeah. experiences. Uh, you know. <laughs> I, think, I think that footage is actually a training film. Oh, a training film. but So it may not have even been a real mustard gas. Mustard, yeah, yeah. It may not have been a, a truly not. lethal mustard gas attack because it's like two guys walking directly toward the camera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? yeah. yeah, yeah. And he's yeah. like, no, but even the voice, the, the interview, whatever it is, it's like, oh, and then there was this gas and it was yellow or something like that. If and and if you didn't have your mask, mask you, you, you put it on your handkerchief and you put it on yeah, your exactly. mouth, it was fine. <laughs> exactly, and it doesn't. But you're like, but this what you know what World War One did. It 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 changed the entire makeup of the world, like culturally. The futurists came out of it, and I'm and I'm an amateur in this, and I can already point to like many technological evolutions, and it's just down to Lots it was yellow, and you peed on your handkerchief. Um, I think, is it Sorry. Leanne, Cherie, and then yeah. Paul? Cherie, wait. Yeah, just a, a small uh, thought. I keep wondering how unique th- is this discussion we are having. Um, I think there must have been, or there must exist, uh, similar discussions regarding other arts. I'm thinking of literature. It's quite common if you make a, a new edition of a book by Dickens, probably, that you make like, changes to the language. You don't use the language, because spelling has changed since. I, I can see uh, a bunch of uh, literary historians <laughs> and, being, and finding it outrageous and, and saying that, oh, but modern audiences, they do understand this, this Dickens language. They, they do be able to engage with that. So I wonder whether we, we can bring um, the discussion further or make up our minds about this by looking at other uh, 
like all the arts and all the examples. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So it's just a suggestion for whoever <laughs> wants to <laughs> follow up on this, but I wonder if there's... I mean, I guess a, a good analogy might be uh, Shakespeare. Obviously, yeah. Shakespeare is taught in every school in the country to 14 to 18-year-olds. You know, it's hard getting 14 year 18 year olds to engage in Shakespearean language, but like we manage it. <laughs> Why can't we <laughs> give the same? Huh? We don't do Shakespearean spelling. No, true, that so, is true. And uh, maybe we can think of, about this film in terms of an adaptation. Hmm. With like a Shakespeare being adapted. So it's like a child's <laughs> language. And that's how people <coughs> know it. Yeah, yeah but Shakespeare is fiction. Mm. Yeah, of course. The, yeah. the, the ethical stakes are quite different here. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah, Paul, do you want to... Yeah, so speaking about the immersion, uh, that's what cinema is about. We want to be in places where in normal life we don't want to be. Uh, and the Hernandez film is all about that. It's especially a film so that you have the feeling that you're among those soldiers. It, 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 it kind of perverse, but the public, and I'm part of the public, appreciates this illusion to be mm -hmm. in it. I mean, I think one of the really, uh, obviously I teach the Battle of the Somme to my undergraduates all the time, but actually, and the, the point of the Battle of the Somme, as you say, is for people at home to be able to feel like they had a sense of what their loved ones were going through. Yeah. And it seems to me, if you teach it in those terms, and say to your kids, you know, not imagine you're at the front, mm -hmm. but imagine you are an audience at home with a son at the front or a brother at the front watching this film, how do you feel? They really respond to it, like they completely get it. Um, and the, I mean, that's one of my kind of issues, obviously there are often many, many issues with the film, <laughs> is that it, it is because it erases the films that it is based on, it also erases the history of the experience that the film's made for the yeah. historical audiences. Yes. Yeah, it's films. a bit of a mockery. I mean, this is what I said. Yeah. I, I watched I mean, Ken Burns' Vietnam as a compare and contrast, and I, it, there was not a single sentence or a single shot that it was a not, like, yeah, boys' days out, you know? Like, we're just, it, it, that really stung me the most. But I mean, so. on, I mean, on some level, that like if you're thinking about the contemporary audience for Battle of the Somme, and you, like, Toby Haggis did that whole thing where he, uh, he, recreated the suggested score that was released with the Battle of the Storm. And it is very much Boys' Day Out. And you'd like, you show that to the students with the Boys' Day Out music and they're like, okay, like the past is weird and different to what I was expecting it to be. And that's a really good starting point for kind of engaging. But I mean, obviously that's not the same yeah. kind of uh, situation. Rule, perhaps? I'm just wondering, as I was gonna say, this kind of thing has been done before. If, if you think, uh, for instance, about the Apocalypse series that, that, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. was made about the First World War and the mm -hmm. Second World War, and, and that's been widely distributed, aren't they, on DVD and so on. And, and I'm wondering to which extent this debate is, is just about what Peter Jackson did, or is it also about the pretension? Like, like I'm, you know, li like nobody, like th this material was completely useless. It, it has been rotting away in the archives and not, not paying any, as, as Florence wrote in his piece, uh, not paying any respect to the people who have been restoring the film before. Mm -hmm. For me, that's the issue. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I... More the pretense than... Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, I mean, Peter Jackson can do what he likes. Um, if he's, he's cleared the rights and he's paid his money and all the rest of it. Um, you know, I don't have an issue with people reusing or doing, you know, things that I wouldn't necessarily like with archive footage once they're honest about it. Um, and it's the lack of respect to the people who have gone before his pretension that, you know, this material was in a terrible condition and that nobody had seen it properly and all, all of the many, many things that he said um, around it. That annoys me um, as an archivist. Um, it would annoy me as a historian. It annoys me for many, many reasons. Um, so, I mean, if he just said, look, I've made this new thing with this great footage. I wanted to create something new that was more immersive, that does this, that, and the other, that uses modern techniques to use it to create essentially a fictional version from his viewpoint of what the war was like. 
fine. That's grand. I have no problem with that at all. But that's not what he's pretending this is. Um, and that's where it's problematic for me. Um, and that's where it's unethical for me. There's a point in the interview, I don't know if you've seen it, but mm. he's interviewed by Mark Camo, you know, at the premiere event. And he basically says, I wish all the archives would send me their footage. <laughs> and I would be able to restore it for them like this. He might be knocking on your door. And he's like, it's not an irony, it's not a joke. He really thinks that, that you know, that is his he's role. He's doing it uh, with Beatles next, isn't he? Or something. Is he doing some kind of... Anyway, <laughs> but we'll, we'll go for Brett and then Jamie and then at the back and then we'll finish that one. So, so I'll have to yeah, I'll, I'll be brief. <laughs> I mean, I just want to say, to me, the big ethical problem, the big ethical failing in this film is the way that it conflates and compresses three different layers or moments of agency and subjectivity. The footage itself, right, and the context of the war, the viewing experience, the subjective viewing experience of the audience, but then also the, the experience of the soldiers themselves, both as combatants and as, as film subjects. And the, one of the curious things about this film is, and Jackson mentions this in the deep bonus feature on the American version DVD, he talks about how he, he likes these moments where they look self-consciously at the camera. And there are moments where they're sort of like laughing and saying, oh, look, Mom, I'm in the pictures. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I think that's very telling of his own ethical and subjective position. So, but, but then there's all the archival subjectivity and agency that goes between. But the, I, I think one of the greatest problems with the film is the fact that he's, he's taken BBC interviews which, as I understand, because the credits are so sloppy, you can't even mm -hmm. tell when the stuff was for the 109 you know, witnesses was recorded. But in the 60s and the 70s, but they, they, these were recorded at different times, in different places, without any visual prompt for these people. I mean, you can imagine like a Claude Lanzmann, for example, mm -hmm. doing a kind of retrospective retrieval of memory by taking a witness or a survivor to a place, right? And that has a real value to it. But he's doing something that is ethically 180 degrees from that here. And of course, these are the guys who survived, which is why, well, it was a camping trip with a mm -hmm. spice yeah, of danger. Yeah, that's exactly. the exact that's, quote that's, that's, used yeah, in yeah, the yeah, film. Yeah, yeah. So of <laughs> course, these guys are going to have a much rosier retrospective view of the war uh, uh, than the ones who had half their face blown. Well, but also, that, I mean, that is, that, that is a big debate in... First World War studies, you know, this, yeah. this kind of effect of memory, because actually, it, and this is certainly something that I've found looking at the 1920s, in the 1920s, in those documentaries that are made in the 1920s, you know, the war is a good thing, we won it and it's fab, and, you know, and those, 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 those documentaries were shown and you know celebrated by regimental organizations who were meeting every you know couple of months with their old war buddies and their experience of the war was that it was fun you know yeah, that actually yeah. because they had survived yeah. and yes obviously in the background there's a load of mourning going on and they're also these regimental yeah. meetings are in fact remembrance services but they, but that it's like as the people die and you've only got one person left who survives the war and everybody around him is like super young and has this very 60s version of how the war was the most tragic event ever of course he's then going to reproduce that yeah. whereas in the 1920s actually his feelings were very it's just i mean and there is a there's a lot of literature about the historiography of how that exactly of how and those all, and it's all attitudes wiped change. out by this, so yes. Yeah, I don't think Jackson had that in mind. No, and I'm the sure third, and then, Just to finish quickly, and then the third moment, of course, is the subjectivity and the agency of the 2018 or the 2020 spectator looking back, hmm. right? And, and it's, it's in the gaps between these three moments or levels of agency and subjectivity. I mean, this is the stuff of history and of memory and of historiography. And this is what, going back to the pedagogical context, this is what, as a film historian and just a historian, this is what I want, my, where, this is the space in which I want my students to think and analyze and learn. And this film flattens yeah. all that. Yeah, no, and, and with the, the pretentious label of telling us this is more real and more authentic than anything else that's ever been produced. And, and that's, that's what I find crazy. And the, yeah. other, the other crazy thing is, how can a Kiwi, whose father was in the British effing Imperial Army from 1910 to 1919, have this cherry take on the British, the, the exploitative British colonial army, right, and its use 
of subaltern troops from the colonies, both of color and white, right? And not mention that. And frame this film at the end as a, as a tribute to his grandfather. I mean, have you not seen Gallipoli? Jesus <laughs> Christ, Jackson, you know. Go, go look at the films that were made about the war from your, from your own, you know, part of the world. I mean, that's, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm done. But. I, I was going to say, I'm not quite feeling the love for Jackson going on here, but you know. <laughs> but I mean, <laughs> I guess it will be agree. interesting to know, well, to see as time goes on, whether this becomes that totemic image of the First World yes. War for the next generation, or whether it just gets completely it died and, and yeah. dies. Um, could we just have uh, Jamie and then the gentleman at the back, and then you can come back to the panel for comments to wrap up. I just wanted to, the other thing about this film that interests me the most is the lip reading, right? Because um, he actually hired lip readers to try to figure out what the soldiers were saying, and then had actors read those lines, right? But like, I mean, if you think about bad lip reading, is everyone familiar with bad lip reading? Like, lip readers, you know, they might be able to figure out what they said, but they might also have gotten it completely wrong, yeah. right? And they could have said something completely different, and then to impose the voice so that it sounds like an interview, potentially, or not an interview, I guess, but uh, like synchronous sound, like an actual mm -hmm. recording um, with the image. You know, I think we know that it's added, but for how long are people going to be able to keep that in their minds, right? And it's that sort of seamlessness. I mean, it's like when you can see the scene, like if there was a credit, if it was like voice actor so and so, right? Like then it's like, okay, so you're just trying to figure out what they said and you're guessing and we can see that you've added this. But of course that's not visible, or it's not audible, it's not visible, it's not made clear. So I mean, it becomes ventriloquism, right? And um, potentially uh, also inaccurate yeah, ventriloquism. Yeah. So it's a, in a way a sort of audio equivalent, equivalent to the colorization. Um, would you like to make your point? Um, just listening to all what you said, <coughs> as a Beatles fan, I, I hate to think what he's going to do with Beatles footage of Red Queen. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the respect for the, the, the music of Red Queen. And just on another point, I think because who he is and the money behind him and all that, he's made it accessible. And I think that probably puts the onus back on us when the film's there is about accessibility. And like that comes back to budgets and money and funding and all that. And we don't have that money to make all of what you're trying to do more accessible to younger people and, and bring in new or, newer audiences. But that is the that is the point. That I, I think why does he get the money to make it accessible in this form? And smart people who studied worked have massive track records and all of this don't get the same funding. It's just skewed in my head. It's disgust it, it feels like now I'm gonna use this word disgusting because it doesn't have to be an experience. It doesn't have to be an added value when it comes to this kind of thing. I'm all for immersive cinema. For example, if you watch Hugo, you see the landing of the moon in 3D, and that was fucking... <laughs> <laughs> and, that was, and that was really awesome, you know? I was watching Hugo, and it was a cute story, and it was lovely, and then you watch, to, you know, you watch it in color, and I'd seen it at Pordenone, then I'd see it in 3D, and I was like, that's nice. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to debate that, but it's this... If, how do we, in order to have empathy and in order to project ourselves into like horrible situations, do we actually need to live in a cave and go to the trenches and inhale mustard gas? Have we lost every any type of empathy? And so this is what I mean. It feels like it's a, it's it, ta it says more about our society and who we are than about anything else in in, in a particular way that money gets spent on this, but not on 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 developing educational programs, making. Um, IFI players for every institution, clearing copyrights for all of that. Because without money, we could have cleared all the copyrights yeah. potentially yeah. for so many more archival and yeah. or other um, works. That makes me sad. Would the rest of the panel like to just say anything to sort of conclude or? <laughs> Look at wine talk in a bit. I think it's just about what's coming in the future and how yeah. we manage it and that this debate is important because um, you know, we don't want to stultify creativity. Uh, we don't want to stultify the money that may come from people with lots of access to lots of money. Um, somebody who works in the industry and sort of facilitates this. Um, not, not this one, just holding one, <laughs> definitely not. Um, but you know, who could potentially facilitate something else similar. I feel that there is definitely, you know, somebody asked in the in the 
when we're talking about is there anything you wouldn't work on okay so I'm going to say if that had come to me to do archive research on at the time when it was made I would have been happy days you know great because you don't know at the beginning of the project how it's going to end up and you don't have the control over necessarily how it finishes so we're all kind of you know not we're all complicit but a lot of the people who work on these productions are complicit in how they they end up um, but having this debate and having this issue, I think it's an issue. I think it's a big deal that this was made and that it came out in the way that it did and it had the impact that it did. Um, and maybe that gives you the opportunity to say, well, actually, you know, don't want it to be like that film. I want to do something, but want to do it differently or better. So, you know, let that be the stepping yeah. point to do that. Listen, I think. Mm. Anyone? Yeah, um, I mean, I would agree. I think, um, you know, my position isn't that this shouldn't have been made, um, or that people shouldn't be able to explore new ways of bringing material to audiences. But I also think that you know we should have conversations about ethics, and we should have conversations about how this footage survived in the first place. Because I think the role of archivists, and it's a very you know, behind the scenes job. Um, it's very hard to get funding. Um, and often the end results that people celebrate are things that other people do. Um, so I think we need to write ourselves into the story a bit more. Um, and that's what I was trying to explain earlier on in, you know, us utilizing the IFI player to tell the story of how the footage got there um, and got out to audiences. And I think we just have to be a little bit more proactive in making um, people write us into the story. I don't think I've got anything more to say. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'd like to thank <laughs> our wonderful panelists uh, for this second plenary panel. Um, I've really enjoyed the conversation. Um, sorry it's so late, but uh, um, well, thank you very much. If we could thank our panelists, please. Thank you.